G'day friends, uh, sorry we're um, out of power at the moment, so I'm trying to record my sermon in a way that's going to be useful uh, for everybody. Um, so uh, we won't have any PowerPoint today, um, but uh, I'm, I'm here and uh, we'll see how we go. Um, yes, a few complications, a <laughs> few issues, but that's okay, we'll deal with that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're God. We thank you that you care for us, you know us, you know our needs, and you know what's going on for us now. I pray that this sermon would be an encouragement to all who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin our passage today by reading from a book uh, called The Five Love Languages. Let me read. Psychologists have concluded that the need to feel loved is a primary human emotional need. For love, we will climb mountains, cross seas, traverse deserts, sands, and endure untold hardships. Without love, mountains become unclimbable, seas uncrossable, deserts unbearable, and hardships our plight in life. The Christian apostle of the Gentiles, Paul, exalted love when he indicated that all human accomplishments that are not motivated by love are in the end empty. He concluded that in the last scene of human drama, only three characters will remain, Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We love love. We love the concept of love. We love the idea of being in love. We love being loved. Uh, we love it because, well, it's a need. It's a, it's a basic part of being human that we want to feel loved. We want to know that we're loved. And uh, as we continue our look through uh, the letters of John, 1, 2, and 3, John, we're in the second half of chapter 3 of John. I'm not going to have the screens up, so let me encourage you to have your Bible open. If you haven't got it now, press pause and go and grab it. 1 John chapter 3, we're up to verse 11. And John actually makes clear um, the importance of love. And I guess the question I want to ask today is what does it look like when you love someone? Uh, the five love languages deals with how you love someone in a, in a marriage relationship. Uh, John isn't dealing with that. He's talking about love within the church. How do we love people within the church? That's the question for today. So let's have a look. But chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. We Christians, members of God's family, uh, the church, are to love one another. John has embraced the words of Jesus. Uh, John followed around Jesus for three years. Uh, he followed them around. In John chapter 13, verse 35, John wrote down the words of Jesus. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Everyone will know who you are. Well, they will know that you are mine if you love one another. That's what, how they are to live. That's how they are to treat one another. Uh, that's the basic reality that they are to, we, are to, we as the church are to love one another. Uh, so that's, that's, that's where John's coming from. And John provides us with some understanding of what that is. He provides us both, both with positive examples and negative examples. And he starts with a negative example. In verse 12, he says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. It's a bit strange that John begins with a negative example, but he goes back to the beginning of the Bible after the fall. The first set of brothers, Cain and Abel, they know God. They're in relationship with God. And uh, Abel brought something that pleased God. Cain brought something that didn't please God. And Cain was so upset that he got what, uh, Abel got what Cain wanted, that Cain, uh, that Abel was affirmed and Cain wasn't, that Cain killed Abel. He murdered his brother. Cain's deeds were evil. Abel's deeds were righteous. 
They were right in the eyes of God. So what does it look like to love your brother? Well, it doesn't look like murder. It doesn't look like hate. It doesn't look like you want what that other person has and you try and take it from them. So then John goes on, verse 13, don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. It's, again, a, quite a weird and negative statement. But what he's saying is that when you, the brothers and sisters of Christ, the children of God, when you love one another, don't be surprised that that doesn't mean that you're uh, popular in the world's eyes, that everybody doesn't look at you and go, oh, wow, what a wonderful thing, that they actually dislike you because of it, that they even hate you, that they're angry with you. There are all sorts of reasons that that might happen. But I think what it means is we shouldn't be surprised when people don't like us because we live a godly life, because we love one another. Love seems like a positive, but it's not always going to be the way. So I think it's fair to say that when we love, we shouldn't expect popularity from the world. Loving isn't murdering those who we're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to love, and love isn't being liked by everyone. But loving others does mean that we have life. Verse 14 says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And here again, we have John presenting a very black and white picture of those who are Christian and those who aren't. Those who love and those who don't. Those who love the brothers, those who have passed out of death into life, and those are, are opposed to those who abide in death, who have not passed from death to life, who remain dead in their sins. Again, I think John is shaped by the words of Jesus. Jesus taught when he was uh, giving his sermon on the mount in Matthew 5, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, again anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is an answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus was black and white in his thinking, and he pushed the expectations of what it was, what it was like to live a righteous life beyond what you just did with your hands to what you did with your minds. Jesus pushed and John is going there. The call to love is one that will impact not just what we do, but what we think as well. So what does it look like to love someone? What does it actually look like? Verse 16 says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Jesus is the example of what love is. He laid down his life for us. Love means that you put another person's needs in front of your own, that you're willing to be inconvenienced, that you're willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of another. And Jesus is the model provided for us for how we are to love one another. But John goes on and he provides another negative example of what it isn't. Verse 17, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. He goes to a negative example. Well, See, the, the difference between loving someone and murdering someone, they're very different. No, even the difference, we would say, the difference between hating someone and murdering someone are very different. What we've got here in verse 17 is a picture of someone who's, I don't really care that much. I'm not that bothered. And what he's, John's saying is, if you've got stuff, if you've got the ability to look after someone and you see someone who is a brother or sister in need, you are to provide what they have for them. You are to give them. And if you don't, if you see their need and ignore it, well, how does God's love abide in you? 
John wants us to be loving. He points out what the negative is because he knows it's hard and he wants us to take him seriously. Jesus, uh, John is telling us that we are to give what we have, not out of our surplus, but out of what we've got to care for those in need that are presented to us. We're to give the shirt off our back. We're to love them. And if we don't do this, well, do we really understand what Jesus has done for us? Do we really understand what Jesus has given up for us? John says that we're not just to love in theory, but in reality. We're not just to offer to pray, we're to actually pray. We're not just to offer to say, uh, sure, come over when you, whenever, you're, whenever you're nearby. If you need a meal, give me a call and then ignore the call. We're to take it seriously. We're to actually give from what we have. I used to have a live with a guy who was very generous with my stuff. I'd say, oh, yeah, yeah take this. You can just have Simon's. Uh, now, I didn't really enjoy that very much and it didn't go very well, but um, it was annoying because I didn't get the choice. He was making the decision for me. Where to love, where to be generous with what we've got, not with what you've got. We're not to say, oh, this person should be generous to you. Others should be generous to me. Where to, the call here is on us to choose how we can think about what we've got and how we can use what we've got to meet the needs of others, to love others. John again confronts us, verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. We, we can, John says we should be reassured by what we do. And are we? When, we, when I read before verse 17, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? I can certainly think of occasions when I have, well, not taken the opportunity to love, when I've ignored those in need. And I'm pretty sure we all can. It feels uncomfortable to read that. That how does God's love abide in me if that's the case? If we're looking for assurance from our own deeds, then I think we are in danger because we've failed. We fail to love. We often uh, ignore the chance, pass up the opportunity. Does God's love abide in us? Do our hearts condemn us? Yes. Verse 20 says, for whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Friends, our hearts will condemn us because we have failed and we are flawed. And when our hearts tell us we really aren't saved because we really aren't good enough, we need to say, yeah, you're right, heart. I'm not good enough. And I'm not right with God because I'm good enough. I'm right with God because Jesus laid down his life for me. This is love that I've experienced. Jesus didn't lay down his life so that I would do the right thing so that I could earn a relationship with God. He laid down his life so I could have the right relationship with God. I, know, I can know that I've passed from death to life because I know what Jesus has done, because I understand what Jesus has done for me. I stand before God confident that Jesus has done the right thing and therefore I ask God to help me, to forgive me, to change me, to enable me to love my brothers and sisters, to follow his commandments and please him. Verse 23, and this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us and by the spirit whom he has given us. We are called to love one another. We are called to follow Jesus' example of laying down our lives for others. 
of giving up our, what we have for others. The call is on us as individuals. It's not, it's not a call on us to decide what, how you should love. It's not for me to decide how you should love. It's not for you to decide how I should love. It's for me to decide, to decide how I should love. For me to look inside myself to look at what I have, how God has gifted me, the things that he's given me, and to look around to how I can love others. Love is active. Love takes seriously our faith in Jesus. Love takes seriously our submission to Jesus as Lord and King. That's why when it talks about uh, when we do the right thing, we are when we're in one heart with God, our pre- he'll give what we pray for because our prayers will be in line with what he wants to give us. Our prayers will be in line with what he is like and how he is. Friends, the call of this passage is to love. The church should be filled with love. The church should be known for its love. And love, it's not like marital love. It's 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 not in love. It's costly, it's real, it's serious. It's you using who you are to love those who God has put you around, put around you. So let me read from 1 Corinthians 13 when we consider how we can love and what love is like. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when you think about this, it would be great to turn to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 and say, God, help me to love. Help me to be patient and kind. Help me to not envy or boast. Help me to not be arrogant or rude, to not insist on my own way, to not be irritable or resentful, to not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoice with the truth. Help me to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Friends, wouldn't it be great if we were known as Jesus people because we were people who loved one another? Heavenly Father, help us to be people who are known for our love for one another. Amen.